You may have heard the term executive functioning before, but you may or may not know what it actually means. You also might not know that up to 80% of the autistic population may struggle with executive functioning issues. Today we're going to go over what is executive functioning, how that plays out practically in our lives, and I'll share some strategies for working with the executive functioning challenges that you may have as someone on the spectrum. I'm also going to share a quiz that you can take at the end of this video that may help highlight some of your executive functioning strengths and weaknesses. So make sure you stick around until the end to get a link to that questionnaire, because if you're like me and a lot of other people on the spectrum, we like questionnaires. All right, let's get started. the channel. I'm Taylor with Mom on the Spectrum. I was diagnosed with autism at 31 years old. This was after years of therapy and all of the self-tests in the world. I knew that my brain functioned differently than other people's, but I couldn't figure out why. After my professional diagnosis in 2020, I was frustrated by the lack of resources available for autistic adults because autistic kids grow up to be autistic adults and there just aren't enough resources, especially for autistic females and parents who are autistic, not just parents of autistic children, but autistic parents. And I do also have autistic children, so I share other resources on the channel pertaining to those very unique challenges. So starting my channel was a way that I could help provide additional resources for the autistic community. As someone on the spectrum, I don't want to be fixed or healed. I just want to be better understood. It's really important that we learn more about autism directly from autistic people. You can do that by supporting my channel in one of several different ways. First of all, if you enjoy the video, you can give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and hit the little bell so you don't miss any of the weekly videos. You can also leave a comment in the box below and join the discussion surrounding this video. I love my community here at Mom on the Spectrum. I feel like I've finally found my tribe and I think you'll find that if you get involved in the conversation, you might just connect to someone else who has a lot in common with you. On to executive functioning. First of all, what is it? This is from one of my favorite autism websites, embrace-autism.com. Executive function skills are the mental processes that enable us to plan, focus attention, remember instructions, juggle multiple tasks successfully, and self-regulate. My kitty is trying to come up in my lap. Come here. Here he is. Hey, buddy. How is your executive functioning? You're pretty good at making decisions to snuggle. If you haven't met him already, his name is Beltre. We call him Belts. It's a weird name, I know. That's what happens when you let your three-year-old daughter name your cat. Our executive functioning mainly takes place in our frontal lobe, more specifically the prefrontal cortex. That's hard to say. Pref prefrontal cortex, oftentimes abbreviated PFC, which I now understand to be necessary. This is from a medical journal. Executive functioning has been broadly defined as the overarching regulation of goal-directed, future-oriented, higher-order cognitive processes. What does that mean? Things like planning, organization, and self-regulation. These things can be affected even though your general intellectual ability may not be affected. Then I found something really interesting. For some people with autism, social and communication difficulties are not the primary issue. They're socially engaged and doing their best to communicate frequently, but they're unable able to respond in a timely and organized way to the requests of parents and teachers, or to organize and initiate sophisticated activities because they have considerable difficulty with executive function. I thought that was super interesting. Now, before we get started, it's important to understand that executive functioning challenges can also kind of present on a spectrum similar to autism. So just because you're autistic doesn't mean you're going to have all of these challenges. Some of them might actually be a strength for you. And you can also have executive function disorder without having autism. So now that we've got that out of the way, here are 12 specific factors related to executive functioning. And this is more from the Embrace Autism website. Number one, response inhibition. Thinking before you act allows us time to evaluate situations and the impact of our behavior. Number two, working memory. I feel like this is something that I am really affected by. Holding information in our memory while performing complex tasks. Also, the ability to draw on prior learning or experience and apply to either the situation at hand or one in the future. Managing working memory is very hard for me. If I'm trying to hold a piece of information in my head and do something else with it, oh my goodness, if there's any other noise or lights or sounds or distractions, it's a losing game for me. For example, trying to shoot this video, like reading this information and trying to hold it in my brain and then put it into 
to words, sometimes I get so overwhelmed by it and I completely forget where I'm going with it. Whenever I try to synthesize information, I just get so lost sometimes. Y'all wouldn't believe the amount of dead space that I cut out of these videos because I'm just trying to organize my thoughts, even though they're right here. Number three, emotional control. Managing emotions to achieve goals, complete tasks, or control and direct behavior. Issues with this element might come out as emotional outbursts, or it could be the opposite side of the spectrum where you don't emote. For me, I feel like I'm more on the not emoting side. I feel like I'm becoming healthier and being able to manage my emotions through a lot of therapy, but I tend to struggle less with the emotional outburst. I think I feel them on the inside. Like I see my son have these very overt emotional outbursts. And I told my husband one day, I said, I feel that way inside. I've just trained myself to suppress that. Like if too many people are talking at one time, my son will put his hands on his ears and crouch over and say, you're hurting my ears. And I feel that way in social situations, but I don't do it. Number four, sustained attention. Maintaining attention despite distraction, fatigue, or boredom. That one's pretty self-explanatory. I think one thing to note here is that as someone on the spectrum, our special interest can sometimes allow us to have long sustained attention. That's one of those elements of autism that can be pretty telling. If you have a certain topic that you could just spend hours and hours researching or learning about or practicing. So it'd be interesting to hear from y'all in the comments how you feel like this particular one relates to you. Number five, task initiation. Beginning projects in an efficient or timely manner and without undue procrastination. Oh my goodness. Um, I tend to procrastinate. I feel like I work better when I am on a deadline and I really need to get something done. I'm gonna go to number six because it kind of goes with this one. Planning and prioritization. The ability to reach goals or complete tasks by discerning what's important and what's not. I have a lot of issue with this. I will focus so much time on one very small, tiny detail that might not have any effect on what I actually need to do. But if there's something in front of me to do and I get fixated on it, I will just do it until it's done, even if it doesn't matter. So I think that goes along with the task initiation and that like I have a hard time initiating certain things because I'll get bogged down by these details that may or may not matter at all. They matter to me. Number seven, organization. Creating and maintaining systems to track information or materials. Now, if you come over to my house, you would think that I'm pretty organized. And I think most people in my life think that I'm very organized. I wouldn't say that's not true. I would just say that it's very difficult for me to do that but I have a hard time living in an unorganized environment. Everything you can see looks pretty clean and organized, but in terms of like drawers and closets and that kind of thing, those are very hard for me to keep organized, but I tend to do a pretty good job of open spaces that are common spaces. I tend to be able to keep those pretty clean because I have a really hard time concentrating if they're messy. But honestly, one of the best things that I've done for myself is when we are able to do this, I hire a cleaner to come clean our house. Cleaning the house is really, really hard for me. It requires so much bandwidth in my brain, like not just the actual cleaning, but having that in my brain that I'm thinking like, oh gosh, I have to clean the house. I have to clean the house. That mental weight, it's like omnipresent. It just takes so much mental energy for me to actually do it. So whenever we have the ability to hire a cleaner, that has transformed my life in a lot of ways. It helps my mental health so much to just know in the back of my head, I'm going to have someone come take care of this for me. And I know that that's a luxury and I'm really grateful for it. And that might not be available to you at the moment, but it might be something to consider budgeting for or planning for in the future as a way to help you manage some of the executive functioning challenges that you may be living with. Number eight, time management. <laughs> I'm laughing. The capacity to estimate time, allocate time, and stay within its limits. Also involved in the sense of time's importance. I think that I sorely underestimate how much time things take. For example, in getting videos ready, I might budget 30 minutes to research what I'm gonna talk about and write about it, and it ends up bleeding into the next day. It takes me so much time to do stuff, and especially to get ready to go places, I feel like it just takes me forever to do normal things that other people can do very quickly, like getting dressed, brushing my teeth, brushing my hair, putting some makeup on, and then actually arriving in a place I feel like it takes me so much longer to do that than it takes other people. Definitely feels like it takes a lot more mental energy and focus to make it actually happen. Some people seem like they can just do it on autopilot, but it's always a huge accomplishment when I have brushed my teeth. I brush my teeth every day, but it's always a huge accomplishment after I've done it. I'm like, oh yes, 
I don't have to think about that anymore. Number nine, goal-directed persistence. How you develop goals, follow them through to completion, avoid the distraction of competing interests, and revise plans due to obstacles, new information, or mistakes. This also is probably something that is affected by ADHD. So since I have both, that one is very interesting for me. I definitely deal with the distraction of competing interests all the time. A lot of times I'll make a to-do list of things that I wanna do that day and get done and it'll be beautiful and it'll make sense and it will be practical and it will follow the layout of where I'm gonna be that day. And it's like a list that I'm really proud of and then I'll get up out of the chair and I will do nothing on that list and have a completely different day than what I scheduled. It's so frustrating, but I still somehow find comfort in making lists. I don't know. What I'm doing right now is I just have a running to-do list on my iPhone and it's not like a daily to-do list. It's kind of like a life to-do list. And if there's something that absolutely has to get done, I put it on that note on my iPhone and I trust that it will keep that there for me. I do the same thing with my calendar. I have to have alerts in my calendar in order for things to get done. Anything that I'm committed to, it's in my calendar. There's an alert, there's an alarm, probably two. And then sometimes I'll even email myself more information about that commitment and what I need to know in order to make it successful. Oh, oh Beltray, <laughs> that scared me to death. What are you doing? Oh. Okay, speaking of, number 10, flexibility. The ability to revise plans in the face of obstacles, setbacks, new information, or mistakes. Just kidding, buddy, you're not a mistake. It relates to an adaptability to changing conditions. This is also very hard for me. If I picture something going one way in my brain, it is so hard to gear shift to something different. And I also happen to know that the part of the brain responsible for gear shifting is called the anterior cingulate gyrus, the ACG. So there's that little tidbit of information for you. Number 11, metacognition. Standing back to view oneself in a situation requires self-monitoring and self-evaluative skills, as well as the ability to observe your problem-solving methods. And then number 12, stress tolerance. Thriving in stressful situations and coping with uncertainty, change, and performance demands. I feel like that kind of goes along with flexibility. Being able to cope with unforeseen stress, that can be really, really difficult, and it might even lead to a meltdown if there's a big change and you had envisioned it going another way. That might lead to your nervous system starting to act up, your heart might start racing, you might start breathing more shallowly, and that might put you on track for a meltdown. So that's one important thing to take note of. And I've got other videos on meltdowns. If you're interested in learning how to cope with those and recover from those, that's a huge topic that I talk about here on this channel. Hi. Oh no. Okay, so now that we've covered those sections, here are a few things that you might say if you struggle with executive functioning. I have trouble estimating how long it will take to complete a task. I'm slow at getting ready for school, work, or appointments. If the first solution to a problem doesn't work, I have trouble thinking of a different solution. I get annoyed when tasks are too hard. I have trouble with tasks where I have to come up with my own ideas. It's hard for me to tell how well I'm doing on a task. I have trouble reaching long-term goals. That's one thing that I struggle with. I like to set goals, but I feel like mine change so frequently that my long-term goals a lot of times are never met. Little things frustrate me and I have trouble getting back on track if I'm interrupted. If I'm interrupted, oh my gosh, it's that gear shifting thing again. I get frustrated. I can't hear the person talking to me because I'm only thinking about what I need to get done. It's a very frustrating situation, not only for me, but for anyone around me who's trying to interact with me. So if we struggle with these types of things, what are some things that we can do in order to better manage our brain and find some relief from these challenges? The first thing could be taking this online questionnaire that I mentioned. It's at embrace-autism slash executive-skills-questionnaire-revised. And I'll put that in the description below. This questionnaire is designed to help you focus in on which of these areas of executive functioning are strong for you and which ones are weaker. Based on that information, you can do a lot from there. First of all, don't expect your weaknesses to suddenly become amazing strengths. If you are weak in the area of time management, you might invest some time into exploring different calendar options, different alarm options. So you can look at your strengths and weaknesses, spend some time figuring out how to accommodate those weaknesses and try to better rely on your strengths. So if you really are strong in the area of sustained attention, you can use that to your advantage. You may not 
get to that event on time, but you can assure the person in front of you once you're there that they have your sustained attention and focus. So first of all, becoming aware of your strengths and weaknesses can really help you know how to respond to yourself in challenging situations. Secondly, you can use visual aids to help you. So for example, my kids, we use these magnets on the refrigerator with different pictures of the activities that they're supposed to do that day, brushing their teeth, putting up their clothes, taking a bath, and we use visual representation for each of those things on our refrigerator. I guess the grown-up version of that would be maybe printing out your calendar, having it ready for you on your desk every day, maybe highlighting different things that you need to remember or do. If y'all have any other suggestions for visual aids that you like to use, I'd love to hear about those in the comments below. Third, we can break down tasks into smaller parts. One of my friends actually reminded me about this the other day. If the objective is to go to the grocery store, sometimes that seems too daunting. First thing, put on my shoes. Then the next thing becomes get in the car. Then the next thing becomes put the keys in the car and turn it on. So just little baby steps like that can help make things seem more doable whenever you feel overwhelmed by the big picture. Number four, you can have clearly marked spaces where things go. So if you're organizationally challenged, you might invest in some different baskets or drawers or organizational systems, maybe even get a label maker if those things excite you like they do me. And you can create your own little system for keeping yourself organized. And then lastly, just set aside lots of time and patience to learn about yourself, to learn about the strengths that you have that can help frustrating situations seem more manageable, and also giving yourself grace for the weaknesses and allowing those areas time to grow. Maybe they don't grow like you want them to grow, and the journey for you is giving yourself more self-acceptance and just being present in the moment you're at and not expecting yourself to be further down the road than you are. I think that's something we can all work on. So overall, like I said, everyone can struggle with different elements of executive functioning. You don't have to be autistic, but it is much more likely for people on the spectrum and you may deal with more executive functioning challenges than other people. So the bottom line for me is always make sure that you're giving yourself grace. Each of our brains is as unique as a fingerprint and just because the person next to you lives life one way or appears to have fewer challenges, it doesn't mean that's actually what's going on and it doesn't mean that that's how you should live your life. Be present in this moment. Show up for yourself as you are today. Don't set your expectations too high. Just take one thing at a time, especially in this day and age of COVID, the pandemic, so many different things going on in our world. It's more important than ever to make time for yourself, to give yourself grace, compassion, to allow your strengths to come to the light and use them, and to not worry too much about your weaknesses because none of us are good at everything. I'd love to hear which elements of executive functioning resonated with you the most. If you have any examples you can share, those always help other people who are reading through the comments. I also really love seeing the interactions between everybody. There's so many people who are so encouraging, especially Whitney. Oh my gosh, every time I see your comments, it's always like, oh, she's so sweet. She's helping so many other people. So really take some time to look through the comments and let me hear from you. I make it a point, at least in January of 2022, to respond to as many comments as I can. It's one of my favorite parts about running this channel. And again, I'm always open to hearing video suggestions from you. Lastly, you can check out my downloadable resources at momonthespectrum.net. Many of my resources are free. I've got an emergency card that you can print out and keep with you in case of emergencies that will help you get the support that you need as a person on the spectrum. I also have my grandmother's famous cookie recipe that you can download for free. And then the big kahuna, I have an 11 page meltdown survival guide. If you're on the spectrum, you know that we have these sometimes unexpected, unanticipated things called meltdowns where we kind of lose touch with our surroundings and we're unable to communicate as effectively. We become very easily overwhelmed and it requires some recovery time in order to come back to our normal selves. The meltdown recovery guide is designed to help you identify what types of things trigger those meltdowns, how you can cope during a meltdown and how you can recover afterwards. That download is donation-based, so you can donate whatever feels comfortable to you, and in doing so, you're helping support my business and promote the message of autism acceptance. You can also support me at my PayPal account, paypal.me slash mom on the spectrum. As so many of you have already done, I really appreciate that. Every time I open my inbox and see that there is a donation there, it makes me so happy and keeps me going more than you could ever know. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.